Well, we're back in the book of Romans. We're on Romans chapter 6, and we're going to read verses 1 through 11 of Romans 6. So I invite you to take your copies of God's Word and open to Romans chapter 6 while we read those first 11 verses. Romans 6, 1 through 11. Well, picking up where the Apostle Paul uh, has discussed in chapter 5, the super, the super abundant grace of God that superbounds over every sin, he says this in the first verse of Romans 6, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin, and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let's pray one more time as we begin this study this this morning. Father in heaven, we thank you that we have your word. We thank you that your word is true. It is living and active, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and of spirit and of joints and marrow, and is indeed a discerner of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. We thank you for this, we rejoice in it, and we rejoice that your truth can be conveyed to us today through your word. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, there are two complementary ways to speak about the Christian life, two ways that kind of work together with one another to speak about the Christian life, what we, what we think and what we do, or orthodoxy the things that we believe, and complementary, orthopraxy, the things that we do, our right practices. The the two of them flow together. Orthodoxy, right thinking by faith, leads to orthopraxy, right actions by faith. And it starts with the mind. This is why Paul links spiritual transformation to a renewal of one's mind. You see that in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And that renewed mind, then, should naturally lead to renewed actions. Therefore, when we hear and believe the truth, we are sanctified in the truth. John 17, verse 17. We have to know what to believe so that we can know how to act. And that's why teaching is so important and why it's so necessary to guard the teaching because if our minds become corrupted by false teaching, we can't act in a way that pleases God. Of course, faith is necessary because without faith, it is impossible to please God, Hebrews 11, 6. But if we have faulty teaching, our actions as well are also going to be faulty. Now, the teaching, the truth, is foundational. 
to how we act as saved human beings. And this is the pattern for teaching in the book of Romans and in Paul's other letters. He starts by conveying truth, and then on the basis of that truth, he gives us a set of instructions on how to carry out that truth. Or, in fact, a set of commands on what to do with that truth. In theological terms, or in, in biblical studies terms, it's the difference between indicative and imperative, where Paul lays down what's called an, an indicative, a statement of fact. This is the reality. And then on the basis of that statement of fact, he gives us an imperative. This is what you must do, a call to action. So in the first five chapters of Romans, Paul laid out his doctrines of total depravity, his doctrine of sin, his doctrine of uh, leading to justification by faith. Now, on the basis of that truth, he begins a discussion of sanctification in the Christian life, how that doctrine is then to be played out or worked out in the life of faith putting our justification or orthodoxy into practice, orthopraxy, for the sake of glory, glorifying God and growing in conformity to the image of Christ. Now, Paul does not come to a completed transition between uh, orthodoxy and orthopraxy here. He doesn't come to a completed transition into a study of sanctification, he wouldn't get to that point until chapter 12. But here in chapter 6, Paul at least introduces the concept and he grounds the reality of justification in our Christian life and works in the reality of our being counted righteous by God. And he uses the terminology of being simultaneously dead and alive so that we can understand what our past life is and what our current life is, what we were and what we are now. Using that terminology of being dead to sin and alive to God. Not that sin is dead to us, but that we are dead to sin and, of course, alive to God. Now, on the basis of our being accounted righteous or justified by God through faith in Christ, we should also account ourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. See, in Christ, we are both dead and alive at the same time, awaiting the reality when we will no longer be dead at all at the consummation when we see Jesus face to face. So let's spend some time thinking about this as we look uh, briefly at these 11 verses. We can say, in Christ we are dead to sin and alive to God through baptism into Christ. In Christ, we are dead to sin and alive to God through baptism into Christ. You see that in the first four verses of Romans 6. Now, Paul in chapter 5 talked about the grace of God superabounding over sin so that even as sin increased, God's grace increased all the more. Now, there might be some listening to the Apostle Paul in Rome... And of course, in the book of Philippians, we know that there were people in Rome who were preaching the gospel with impure motives. Uh, you see that in Philippians chapter 1, verses 15 through 17. So there were people in Rome who were preaching the gospel in a wrong way. Paul in Philippians uh, rejoices that at least the gospel is going forth. But... There might be people in Rome who are taking this out of context and saying something like, well, 
if sin brings forth more grace from God, then why not sin more so that we can experience more and more grace? And that's not the point of grace. And Paul now takes that and starts to describe how it's possible to be freed from sin such that even if we do sin, God's grace is still super abundant, but not using that grace as a license to sin more. See, God doesn't give us grace so that we can keep on sinning. He gives us grace to save us from sin and its consequences. Now, I was struggling to find an illustration for this because I think this is a concept that does need illustration or more illustration. And uh, I settled on an illustration that uses uh, the grace that comes from government assistance. Several years ago, uh, Ruth Ann and I, this was before our children were born, uh, we were living in the city of Harrisburg, and we lived in a pretty uh, dense and diverse neighborhood. And some of the, uh, the children in that neighborhood came to Ruth Ann's Good News Club that we held in our um, in our home, and one of the women there had uh, eight children, and several of those children were from different fathers. And she found out that she was pregnant with her ninth child. And she was overjoyed at the arrival of this ninth child, not because a ninth child was coming into her home, but because, as she claimed, it meant she could get a bigger welfare check. See, government assistance, or what has been called welfare, is a grace given by the taxpayers to help people in need. But it's not meant to place us further in need, but rather to help us get back on our feet. So what the woman was doing was demonstrating the principle that Paul was arguing against in verse 1 of chapter 6. Yes, God gives us grace not to indulge in more sin, but to grow in holiness and to grow out of a pattern of sinning. And this woman demonstrated that she would rather sin more so that, in her mind, the grace of government assistance may abound more. And that's wrong. Likewise, when we have the idea, of course, we can be quite indignant about that as taxpayers, but how often do we do it ourselves? Where we indulge in sin, relying on God's grace and think nothing of it, well, that's okay, I'm, I am saved and God's grace superabounds over my sin. And Paul doesn't want us to fall into that trap. But how do we avoid falling into that trap? We avoid falling into that trap by accounting ourselves dead to sin. Now, one clarification here. There's a difference between being dead in sin and being dead to sin. See, being dead in sin is the unsaved condition before justification by faith in Jesus Christ. Paul talks about that in the book of Ephesians. He says to the Ephesian Christians in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, starting in verse 1, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Speaking of the unsaved condition or speaking of our uh, condition before becoming saved and justified in Jesus Christ. You see, if you're in Christ, then that is the condition that you were once in. He uses uh, past tense. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. That is our past. That is not our current. That is not our future. If you are in Christ, you are are dead to sin, if you are in Christ, then you were dead in sin. 
So that condition spoke of our unsaved condition. But if you are in Christ, then that is what you were. It is no longer what you are. Now, there's another phrase Paul uses in verse 11, then, that speaks of our saved condition, which is what we are. It's dead to sin. Now, there's a natural inconsistency with dying to sin, but then continuing to live in it. Look at verse 2. It says, by no means, or I think the King James Version says, God forbid. It's a strong statement against it. How can we who died to sin still live in it? It's not that sin is dead to us. Our sanctification involves putting those sinful deeds to death. You can see that in Romans chapter 8, verse 13. You can see it in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. But the fact is, sin is very much alive, and we must kill it. For Paul's purposes, however, he's not dealing with sin. He's dealing with us. And we are the ones who have Died. Therefore, sin should have no effect on us. It should be like trying to tickle a dead body. I would never try to do such a thing just because of the ick factor. But if you tried to tickle a dead body, I don't think they would give you much of a reaction. If you tried to tickle me, I would show that I'm not a dead body. But if you tickle a dead body and they start to giggle, then you know they're not dead. Right? So, sin and Satan tries to tickle us with sin. We should not be ticklish. Why? Because we are dead to sin. We are in Christ. See, death makes us insensitive to outside influences. Likewise, being dead to sin should make us insensitive to sin's influence. Now, baptism is a picture of this. Paul uses baptism as a way of describing this phenomenon. You see that in verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. See, when you descend into the waters of baptism, you symbolize yourself being immersed into the death of Jesus Christ. Being underwater, even for a split second, you image the burial of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that Paul can say in verse 4, we're buried therefore with him by baptism into death. Which means baptism becomes a helpful way of being reminded of our condition that we are dead to sin and alive to God. I hope you can remember your baptism. I can. I hope you can too. Because It's a means by which you can remember when you died with Christ and died to sin. And in that remembrance, you can also remember that you are now a new person. It's not that baptism saves you. It's that it's a work of sanctification that reminds you of salvation, which made you into a new creation. See, but you don't stay in the water, do you? You come out of that water. Now, when I have baptism seminars, usually with young people, I know I shouldn't say this, but I usually fall into the trap of joking. And inevitably, somebody asks, how long do I stay underwater? And I usually say something like, oh, only about five or ten minutes. And then their eyes get really wide. And then I said, no, 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 I'm, I'm only joking, I'm only joking. You go down, and you come back up. You don't need to stay in the water. 
You go down, you get wet, you come back up. Because what that is is a picture of the fact that Jesus' body didn't see corruption. And if you stayed down there too long, your body would eventually see corruption. But we don't have to stay down there very long to demonstrate the effectiveness of being completely immersed in water and thus being buried with Jesus by baptism. Because it's only a blink of an eye. And, it's, and just as soon as we go under the water, we come out of the water as a picture of Christ's resurrection. So then Paul says, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So we're dead to sin. Our baptism pictures that burial going under ground as it were by going underwater but then it also pictures us re-emerging back up on the other side wet to be sure but alive in a new kind of way that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father we too might walk in newness of life there is never a time after that that you need to be baptized again it's once and done. So Paul reiterates this concept then to the Colossians in Colossians chapter 2. He says, In him, or in Christ, also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him, through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. It was God's great resurrection power that raised Jesus from the dead. Thus, it is also God's great resurrection power that raises us spiritually from the dead and makes us new creations and will ultimately raise us physically from the dead so that we will have resurrected bodies perfect and complete for all eternity. So in coming out of the water, we're symbol, symbolically rising from the dead, having left that sin in the grave. This is where I wish I had a whiteboard that I could draw a diagram here showing us going down into the ground, leaving that sin there and coming back out. Because that's what we've done. The sin is left there. We come out new, washed human beings. Peter talks about the washing of baptism. That's what he's really talking about. We've left sin in the grave and therefore we come out walking in newness of life with the guilt and power of sin still back there in the grave. And we can consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God by remembering our baptism. Well, second thing is, <clears throat> in Christ we're dead to sin and alive to God through union with Jesus Christ. Through union with Jesus Christ. Now, continuing this idea of baptism here, Paul now teaches that this immersing, baptizo, that's what the word means, to dip or to immerse. This immersing is a picture of our union with Christ Brought about, of course, by our justification. Look at verse 5. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Now this union then is demonstrated in two respects. First of all, united in death. See, Jesus was baptized. And John the Baptist said, why, are, are, why am I baptizing you? You should be the one baptizing me, or I should be the one being baptized by you. And Jesus said, let it be done so that we can fulfill all righteousness. It's not that Jesus needed to be baptized. It was the pattern that God had set down for us following him. Thus, just as he was baptized at the beginning of his ministry, 
we are also baptized at the beginning of our service to him. But we are united in death. Now, Paul uses a kind of logical syllogism here. If this, then that. If this is the case, then that must also be the case. See, if we have been united in his death, then we will be united in his resurrection. Now, it's not that we haven't been resurrected, because we have been resurrected spiritually in regeneration. But Paul tells the Ephesians this in Ephesians chapter 2, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, what did he do? He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. So we have been resurrected. But it's a spiritual resurrection. It's to bring that new life in us. And that's a once and done reality. But we are still awaiting our ultimate physical resurrection with Christ. So we are both dead and alive. We are dead to sin. We are insensitive to sin's temptations. But we are also alive to God which means we are sensitive to God's leading. See, we're ni- we are united with Christ in death such that our old self was crucified. And we don't have to keep on crucifying our old self. We just keep crucifying the deeds of the old self. Again, you can see Romans 8, 13, Colossians 3, 5. We can't get into the specifics of that. But go to those verses to study that further. So because we're dead to sin, our old self is dead. We're no longer enslaved to sin, verses 6 and 7, which means we don't have to serve sin anymore. And Paul gets into that a little further uh, beyond verse 11. But we don't have to serve sin because we are united with Christ in death. But there's an also, another aspect to that. We are also united with Christ in life. We are indeed new creations. We are saved. We are cleansed. We are sanctified. And therefore, gr- we are growing rather than dying in our faith. You know, we tend to get discouraged in our faith when we do sin because oftentimes we think of Christian sanctification as a linear process so that Uh, If we go a certain period of time without sinning, we must be growing. But then if we commit one of those besetting sins, we've lost all practice, or excuse me, we've lost all progress, and we have to go back to square one. Well, that's not true. It may feel like we have lost our progress in the faith, But since we are united with Christ in a resurrection like his, then that means we are always growing. We shouldn't sin, and when we do sin, we should confess those sins. But those those sins don't mean that it's game over for you. Those sins don't send you all the way back to the start, so they have to go through the process all over again. I've known of people growing up who believe that they lose their salvation. The moment they sin, they've lost their salvation. So it seems like every week they're coming to the altar, confessing their sins and getting re-saved. No. We are alive with Christ. We are united with Christ in his life. He doesn't have to go back to that tomb anymore. He is continually moving forward, and so are are we. Of course, we have to repent of our sin. But, what does John say in his first epistle? If we confess our sin, he, Christ, is faithful to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We don't have to get re-saved every time we commit sin because we are united in life. We are always growing because we are resurrected spiritually. 
Well, now a third point to consider. <clears throat> a third point. In Christ, we are dead to sin and alive to God through resurrection in Christ. Through resurrection in Christ. This is grounded in our belief in Christ. You see, <coughs> excuse me, you see that in verse 8. But not only are we no longer enslaved to sin, verse 6, but death itself no longer has dominion over us. Look at verse 9. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will, no longer, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Now, if we are in Christ, and on the, on the basis of our justification and his, uh, his uh, substitutionary atonement, what he has experienced, we also experience. If death has no more dominion over him, then death also has no more dominion over over us. See, there, this is where the decay comes in. All of creation is in a state of dying and decay because death has dominion over this creation. You see that in Romans chapter 8, verses 20 and 21. And of course, if we were still under the power of death the moment we sinned, we would immediately reverse course and would never make any spiritual progress. However, in Christ, our inner self is being renewed day by day, 2 Corinthians 4.16. Even though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. This is why in spiritual resurrection, we're constantly growing but we're still awaiting the physical resurrection, so our physical lives are decaying. But with death, that's only a one-time experience. Christ, Jesus Christ, will never die again, so that death no longer has dominion over him. So for the believer, the one who is justified, there is no second death. There's only a second death for those who are not in Christ. Because in Christ, we have died, he has died once and for all. And since he himself died to sin once and for all, verse 9, in his resurrection, he lives to God continually, verse 10. And if this is true of him, then it is also true of us. Because we are in Christ. Therefore, all that Christ experiences we experience too. So in all of that, on, on the basis of all of what Paul has said in the first 10 verses, he now comes to verse 11, which is the imperative. He says in verses 1 through 10, this is the reality. In verse 11, this is what you must do with that reality. And he sums it all up in verse 11. Look at verse 11 with me. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So he had been talking about Jesus' death and his resurrection. Now you, likewise, consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So two more realities. Dead to sin. We are dead to sin. Sin has no more claim on our life. We are insensitive to its charms. People say quite uh, skeptically or sarcastically, the only two things that are for sure in this life are death and taxes. Well, you, you only pay taxes while you live. When you die, your children pay taxes on your inheritance. But you don't pay those taxes. Because you are dead to taxes, you are insensitive to the government's intervention, you don't even care about the election when you're dead to taxes and everything else in this world. So 
You are dead to sin. It has no claim on your life. You are insensitive to its charms. When sin comes knocking, we shouldn't respond because we're dead to sin. When, de when death knocks on our door, we should say, sorry, I'm not home. Too often, though, we open the door and then get into a conversation with sin. Rather, we should consider ourselves dead to sin. But we're not just dead, we're also alive to God. Dead to sin and alive to God. So when sin speaks, we do nothing. But when God speaks, we respond. See, here's the imperative. Paul has just spent the last 10 verses talking about what is the indicative. Now, he tells us what to do with that fact, the imperative, or the praxi. Notice he says, consider. Consider. That's the word logizomai, means to reckon or to count or account. And that's the same word that Paul uses in Romans chapter 4, verse 3, in that Abraham believed God and it was counted, logizomai, to him as righteousness. Now that's the word for justification or uh, uh, being accounted righteous. Now obviously not with the same force and perfection that God consider us righteous through faith in Jesus Christ, but there must be a similar accounting of our de ourselves dead to sin and alive to God. How do we do that? We do that by remembering that we, we were baptized with Christ. Remember what's happened in the past. We were baptized into his death, into his burial. And we were made alive, that baptism pictures. So that's a past reality. We, we remember a past reality. But we also remember a current reality, that we are in union with him, having been crucified with Christ, Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I immediately defaulted to King James, which I always use at ESV. <laughs> I don't know why I keep doing that, because these are the verses that I remember when I was a kid. <laughs> But we are crucified with Christ. And this is a past reality, but the present reality, then we are in union with Christ. We are now alive with Christ, continually living with and to God. See, that's how, then, we can consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to Christ, or alive to God in Christ Jesus. See, on the basis of our being accounted righteous, justified by God through faith in Christ, we should also account ourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. See, the way to live free of sin is to consider or to count ourselves dead to sin and alive to God. And this is the imperative, what we must do. But it's not simply a law to obey. It's a natural outworking of the indicative of what already is the case. We are already dead to sin, and we are already alive to God. We are already in union with Jesus Christ. So the way to live out that reality, right? Romans 1.17, the righteous shall live by faith. How to live out that reality is to fully embrace the indicative, what is, and then use it as a way to live out the imperative, what we must do. So we, we recognize the orthodoxy so that we can live out the orthopraxy. So how can I train my mind to consider these things? By being renewed in my mind, Romans 12, 2. By putting in practice now the things that happened in the past. So Paul says, 
Therefore, my brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Romans 12, 1. See, we're already dead to sin, but in our sanctification, we must practice that through the Spirit's work in us. He says this, uh, Paul says this to the Ephesians in Ephesians 4, 21, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Put off that dead self. And put on that new living self. Put off your dirty old clothes from yesterday and put on brand new clean clothes for today. Take up your cross daily and follow him. Live on a day-to-day-to-day basis being renewed in the spirit of your mind. This is a daily exercise both of putting off and putting on. It's daily considering, daily acting, daily remembering, that's what you were, but this now is what you are. And by doing that, you're able to consider that you are dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And guess what? God's grace superabounds in that consideration. So that you don't need the grace for sin. You, you joyfully receive the grace for putting away that sin on a daily basis, day after day. So let's consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness and mercy to us. Father, what can we do but thank you? You've done it all, and you, you enable us to live our lives joyfully, being sanctified in Christ Jesus, but joyfully having been sanctified by Christ. Lord, thank you for calling us out of darkness into your marvelous light. Thank you that what we were is no longer what we are. So, Father, help us to live in light of what we are and to put to death once and for all what we were. In Jesus' name, amen.